calculations involved. And, uh, you know, it's more than just a simple math exercise because they've done a lot of uh, strategic thinking and cross-tied and interdisciplinary mm-hmm. kind of an approach. So we know that, that we've survived in the past. We know it can't be this fast. And it's likely going to occur two or three jerks um, to get a, even a huge revolution. Two of these episodes back in 21,000 B.C., apparently the Earth spun 72 degrees within the arc of the procession. So that would be spinning basically like three-quarters of the way through the year almost in terms of uh, where you start off. So it'd be kind of weird because you could start off mm. in mm. winter and it yeah, end up it. In, in fall got it. and sort of miss the whole uh, whole summer business, right? In any event, when that occurred, that was one of the more spectacularly damaging ones, and the Russians were able to say that, well, Mm-hmm. That one, in this particular instance, you know, mm-hmm. this mountain range uh, was we know was lifted up this high, and so we can calculate the amount of force that was involved to shove this other plate underneath it. And they've done even more calculations on it and said, okay, mm-hmm. in that particular episode, we think that the level of water was about 800 meters. Well, 800 meters is still considerable, but it's not a mile and a half. That's a lot of pressure, boy. That's that's huge pressure. Yeah, but my point yeah. being that if you were up two or three thousand meters in the hills, herding sheep or whatever, is and this is the one that theoretically most of the well, three thousand meters is nine thousand feet, isn't it? Uh, correct, correct. But I mean, if you were the, this was up eight hundred meters, um, you know, less than a less than a thousand meters, so less than three thousand feet. It was the level of the water. So if you were above that, you would have mm-hmm. survived it. And then can, also, uh, can you go up and, like, can you drive up, you zip up the mountain and, and hang out there for a week? I don't think that'll be the case. There's going to be huge amounts of earthquakes. I don't know that the infrastructure is going to survive. That is, uh, the roads and this kind of thing, we should have months of devastation beforehand. This won't be a sudden event that way. It won't sneak up on us, so to speak, right? What if so, you build a Reich's bunker? Well, you could, and then you may indeed be able to survive, but then you're going to be stuck up there if the water stays there. We have evidence, for instance, that areas of Utah that, that are three and 400 feet above uh, flat plains mm-hmm. were inhabited, and people lived in boats and got into these inhabited, inhabited areas through boats over the course of several uh, decades, 80 mm-hmm. or 90 years, actually. So, mm-hmm. so it'll be hard to predict that kind of thing. Right. Gerald has some ideas, and his, some of his ideas make sense. And, and if I've, I've got an astronomer who's trying to calculate it, and here's my thinking. The Giza Plateau and the uh, arrangement of the Nile River Valley and all of this is known to replicate stars in space and uh, in terms of their arrangement of Orion's belt and so on. Giza Plateau also in, in, encompasses a couple of interesting things. The primary uh, pyramid at, at uh, the Giza Plateau, what we call the uh, Cheops Pyramid, has a difference in the, it's not perfectly square in the base, the difference in the squareness of the base is exactly the same percentage as is the equatorial bulge relative to the overall diameter of the Earth, the circumference of the Earth, excuse me. And so it encodes the equatorial bulge right there, that knowledge in that pyramid. And co- uh, coincidentally, that pyramid is in the exact center of all of the land masses of the planet. And I think it's there for, an, for more than just happenstance. It may be the point around which the rest of the planet spins, so to speak. And that would be that if we arrive at this position where the planet becomes spherical through the loss of the equatorial bulge, then the point of the largest amount of the land mass will be drawn towards the nearest gravitational sources. Huh. And that'll be our down, so to speak. Uh-huh. And if the moon is between us and the sun, then the moon will will sort of try and drag the Giza Plateau to a position directly underneath it relative to the gravitational forces that are going on at the time. And so it may be that that's not only a marker for this having occurred in Leo, thus the Sphinx. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the last time that one of these events occurred 9,000 years ago. But also it may be a, a marker for the point around which the rest of the planet spins. All right. All right. Well, if the Sphinx itself is, is 25, 50,000 years old... It's withstood some rock and roll. And so have pyramids, and that's a real good reason to build yeah, those kinds of They're a little buildings. tougher than the Sphinx, though. Uh, I would think the shape and all the rest of it. And they, yeah, but the Sphinx is down in a hole, cut out in a recess anyway. Yeah. So. Well, the pyramids used to be 
covered with that, that incredible limestone, limestone. too, which would be yeah. pretty slick. Yeah. Well, wow. All right, we just have about a minute and a half left, so how do you want to wrap this up? Well, uh, don't believe any of the things I'm telling you, but uh, <laughs> boy, that boy, the math sure does add up. And go and find out uh-huh. for yourself and read Gerald's stuff. You can find it online. There's a lot yeah. of it. Well, Check a lot of people yourself. are going to say, "All right, the water is going to come over, but the water is going to go back to what, from whence it came." So I'm going to yeah, but I'm you gonna... could have volcanoes going off. You could have nuke plants polluting everything. You may yeah, have well, uh, nuclear place, winter. Right. We're going to have an ice right. age. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near the nuclear power plant industry in this country. No, and People, also, like I say, we're going to have an ice age as a result of this. This yeah. stuff shifts yeah. around. And also, which, I'll but, probably find, you know, my area up in the um, Arctic Circle. My plan is that when I see the Rockies, I'm actually going to turn right and start sailing south. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and you can do that. You can buy, actually. I know some people uh-huh. in Europe that are buying four of these lifeboats that are called free flight lifeboats. And they uh-huh. each hold 30 people, and they're having a modified to only hold 10 people in extra uh Kind of can rotate stuff. 360 and not go under and all that. No, not sink. Yeah, they're yeah, unsinkable yeah. and self-writing and so on. Right, so. right. Wow. So this is actually being planned for by some folks. Well, they're putting money into it. They've got calculations down. It's going to cost 5,000 euros per person mm-hmm. in this group to get into these lifeboats, and then whatever cost for food in addition to that. And it's unknown as to how long you'll have to be on your own in terms of resources. Well, a lot of people are going to want to dig concrete bunkers under the ground and say, all right, I'm six feet under. I can get under there. Solid doors, no problem. I'll just I'll just tough it out. <laughs> yeah, let me know uh, if you're going to figure out a way to as to, to tell whether or not it's dry on the other side of that before you open Periscope. the Periscope. Yeah. A, a yeah. surplus periscope. Yeah. Uh, how else would you do it? I don't well, know. and you know, that's fine. Uh, I'm not called that way. Universe made me a boat builder for whatever reason. Apparently, this is one of it. You know, I'm a small boat guy from way back, kayaks, yeah. all this kind of thing. So that's, well, that's you're, my you're, approach. We'll talk, maybe next time we'll talk more about what you're doing in your boat and then how other people might want to do that. If you want to share that information, it would be kind sure, of fun. Sure, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, this will be uh, kind of our our launch, and we'll uh, we'll stay with this with Cliff uh, until we'll... there's some shakeout in the precursors that goes against his theory and against the uh, the predictions that are in the Mayan and Egyptian codices. And, and we're still on that track. And he'll tell us uh, why. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much for all the hard work and for sharing it here. We'll, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll be, Thank you for ruining my day. <laughs> yeah. We'll put it up uh, and everybody will be able to listen to it and all the rest of it. So thank you. And again, Rebecca did a beautiful job on the on the images. Talk soon, my friend. Okay. We'll, th- we'll see you later. Take care. Bye. All right. all right. There you go. And we'll have it up at rents.com shortly for you to listen to and share. And uh, let, let us know what you think. Don't be too hard on Cliff. He's going to get 8 million responses to this, I'm sure. All right. Be back in 21 hours.